Hi folks and welcome to the Serious Seminar. Due to conflicting schedules and just-in-time rescheduling, there is unfortunately nobody around to introduce me, so I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Matthias Peyer, a new faculty in uh, CS here at Purdue, and my focus is system security. So I do all forms of uh, runtime systems, uh, compiler changes, and programming languages, trying to make programs and applications or code in general more secure and more resilient against ongoing attacks. Um, before I joined Purdue this summer, I did a postdoc at UC Berkeley in the BitBlaze group that focuses on low-level security, binary hardening, uh, and uh, other extensions in the low-level security area. And I did my PhD, before that I did my PhD at ETH Zurich, where I worked on safe runtime systems and uh, moved more and more towards security and security properties for these systems. Um, in this talk, I will convince you that memory corruption is a very important and hard problem and will tell you why it has not yet been solved. So the problem that we face is that low-level languages are prone for bugs, but they are here to stay, and I will discuss possible solutions that we can try to uh, deploy to fix these vulnerabilities and make applications more secure and resilient. So as we see on, on the slides, uh, there's an ongoing, ongoing war between attackers and defenders. Um, uh, on the graph, I quickly plotted a list of vulnerabilities or open vulnerabilities against applications um, in the last 12 years or until mid-2012. So you, on, this, uh, on this figure, you see that there's a large amount of vulnerabilities that happen. And there's an increasing amount of uh, exploits that were abused and all that. In addition, you see that around 2006, there's a, a bend in the curve, especially for code execution and buffer overflows and underflows. That's right the time when a set of defense mechanisms kicked in and reduced the severity of these vulnerabilities and made programs more secure. Unfortunately, the uh, improvement in security was uh, taken over by an improvement in memory corruption techniques where attackers used new and alternate techniques to continue exploiting these vulnerabilities. And a large set of exploits allow code execution, but those depend often on memory corruption. And we'll see what we can do against those to further constrain the attackers. And there are several ways to uh, fix the vulnerabilities in existing code. So to give you one example, um, who of you here knows FFmpeg? One person, five, six. So a bunch of you know FFmpeg. It's a video transcoder that allows you to encode video from one format into another. It's a very important software because um, it may often be used uh, internally in a, in a larger system or as a web service to convert um, video fr from one format into another. And Google internally uses it on their YouTube platform to encode videos. So when you upload a video to YouTube, they use FFmpeg to transform it from one format to the other. So they need to make sure that this software is secure. And they spent some time and found more than a thousand bucks in a single software suite. Also, they had to spend a huge amount of resources. So they spent two person years and they fussed on a large cluster. So they used a lot of hardware uh, to actually find all these bugs. So if you compare these two points, on one hand they found more than a thousand bugs, but on the other hand it was a huge project and they needed a huge amount of resources to, to actually solve it. Now the question becomes, is it actually worth it to proactively try to find all these bugs and vulnerabilities? On one hand it's definitely needed to fix the vulnerabilities, but on the other hand do we want to spend all these resources in advance, considering that there's so much software out there that it's very hard to prioritize where to spend these resources and how to, uh, to prioritize different software services and where to fix it first. So what we, the problem that we face is that software is unsafe and insecure. And we know that low-level languages like C and C++ trade type safety and memory safety for potential performance. So the programmer is responsible for doing all the safety and security checks. 
and has to ensure that the program itself is type safe and secure. If the programmer doesn't do it, there are memory, uh, memory vulnerabilities happen that may be exploited by an attacker. Also, there's a large set of legacy applications that still exist that we have to protect. And it is unfeasible to just rewrite them in a safe language because these, these programs are here to stay. And even uh, for new applications, they are still developed in C or C++. If you just look at one of the biggest or of the bigger software products that were started in recent years, the Google Chrome browser, it's written completely in C++. Uh, according to very safe coding standards that Google developed, but still, as we see yearly in the Pwn to Own contests, these browsers are regularly exploited and people find ways to gain code execution on those. And we need to make these systems more secure as well. And the third point uh, comes back to the motivational slide before. There are more bugs out there than we can possibly find and fix manually. So we need to find or need, we need to have an additional protection that enforces the integrity through some form of safe runtime system and ensures that we can keep or protect our data even in the presence of vulnerability. So in this talk, um, I will present you three cornerstones. First of all, I will discuss a model for memory corruption where we try to understand the problem which uh, this model will then allow us to reason and classify different defense mechanisms along possible attack paths and deploy de defenses uh, that are or may be not effective or whatever. And we'll discuss two possible solutions to this problem. On one hand, a secure execution platform for existing binary code. So if you don't have access to source code and, or aren't able to, to recompile it for one of the possible reasons you can use the secure execution platform to enforce a security policy on top of existing binary code. On the other hand, we'll present code pointer integrity, a strong security policy uh, if you have source code access and can recompile the application. There we can use existing type information and other high level information like data flow, information that is, use, uh, is available in the, uh, in the compiler or on the compiler level. And we'll maybe also discuss some interactions between these two systems. But first off, let's start with the model for memory corruption. Here, the goal is to understand memory corruption, how an attacker seizes it, and follow the path of the attacker, that the, uh, how an application can be compromised from beginning to end. And the model that we define here uh, defines all possible security policies and allows the classification of attacker capabilities along different paths and defense mechanisms. So the attack model that we use is uh, for control flow hijack attack, the reasoning or the, the attacker wants to execute code. And the attacker uses specific bugs and vulnerabilities in the application to modify parts of the application. So the memory corruption may actually happen due to a missing or a faulty safety check somewhere in the code. Uh, and the attacker may modify some data on the stack, some data on the heap, or some data on the, uh, on, in the code level. And the attacker then uses these modified data to get control of the application and redirect it somewhere else to execute the attacker's wanted behavior. So as, we, the, as I expect the audience to come from a wide variety of background, I will try to introduce uh, a quick control flow hijack attack uh, and how it runs in an application so that you can understand and follow it by, by a simple example. So first we look at the benign control flow for this simple, simple code snippet where we have uh, a small C code, a small C function that contains a vulnerable string copy which may be used to override some buffer on the stack and can lead to a heap corruption. So, this leads to a simple stack-based overflow. The input itself is not validated and passed to the array, which can then be longer than the allocated memory on the stack. And this is a very common class of attacks and the foundation uh, for, many, for many attacks. Um, if we execute this piece of code uh, on the lower left side, we'll see the stack frames as they are built up by the compiler and how they are used. So we have the control data structure for the next stack frame being set up and the arguments being passed on the stack, building up. Uh, as soon as we call the function, we push the return address and continue with the saved base pointer. And suddenly we see the 
temporary array being uh, added to the stack, which is then used in a computation in the benign, con uh, benign control flow. We finish the execution of string copy. The function returns or deallocates the stack frame and returns safely to the vulnerable function. This is the benign case. Now, if you look into the uh, attack case, where an attacker can control the input, we see that, again, the stack frame is built up, the return address is pushed onto the stack, we transfer control to the vulnerable function, we allocate space on the stack for the array, and we start executing the string copy function. But this is where it goes wrong. The attacker uh, submits or uh, puts as input a string that is longer than the space that was allocated on the stack, and thereby we start overwriting part of the data that is not part of the original array and will start with a memory corruption. So the attacker overrides the first part of the, uh, of the array and doesn't care what's written in this part of the array. But then the attacker continues and overrides the safe base pointer with some arbitrary value. And this is where the first attack happens. That's where the memory safety viola violation occurs and a policy running on a memory safety uh, a policy that enforces memory safety would stop the attack at this place because it detects a pointer that was supposed to write into the car array is now writing out of bounds. When we continue, uh, the attacker will overwrite the return instruction pointer and point it to some, uh, some gadget or some attacker controlled function. In this case, we'll use the, the system function. This is where the second possible policy kicks in which is an integrity policy, as the attacker overrides a code pointer and gets control over the code pointer. If our policy would implement uh, code pointer integrity, we could stop the attack at this step. In addition to being able to write a value to that location on the stack, the attacker needs to know what kind of value he or she needs to write in there. So all the randomization or probabilistic-based defenses that shuffle memory around uh, use a probabilistic technique to hide the real addresses from the attacker. So the attacker needs to know the location. We continue, uh, write the base pointer to the, uh, according to the attacker controlled uh, location, and uh, at one point in time, we'll start, we'll end up with the return instruction to return to the attacker-controlled compromised stack. This is where the next uh, violation happens. So now that we have compromised memory safety, we've compromised integrity, we found out the location that we wanted to write, we also have to force the program to actually use that compromised pointer. And that's where any control flow integrity can stop the attack and detect it. If none of these defense mechanisms are in place, we have a successful control flow hijack attack. And this is the most common way to attack current systems as it is used in any of the exploits that you see flying by in a little bit simplified form. So if we abstract this from the simple example <laughs> to a higher level model, we see that on one hand, a security policy can implement memory safety and enforce memory safety and protect the application this way. On a deeper level, we can enforce different integrity properties or location properties or usage properties when the compromised code pointers are used. So uh, we have memory corruption at the top if we don't have memory safety. Uh, and as we discussed before, we modify a code pointer by knowing the location of the code pointer and changing or allowing the usage of this code pointer. If all of this succeeds, we have a successful control flow hijack attack. But there are other attacks as well. So for example, we can modify code, actual code. Uh, this is, for example, in just-in-time compilers that have still uh, code that can be modified at runtime. And we no need to know the location and have a successful code corruption that you can use to compromise a browser, for example. Or we have a second class of, atta of attacks that basically mirrors all the code-based attacks. 
and these are database attacks. So we can modify either data that is then used in a later computation, data pointers uh, by knowing data locations, and following data flow properties. So this is the complete model that captures all the possibilities that you have to protect memory against memory safety attacks. And there are large sets of different defense mechanisms implemented at each of these levels. And all of them have their advantages or disadvantages. And we'll discuss a couple of those. Um, there are only few defense mechanisms that have made it to practice. And let's quickly walk through them. The first is data execution prevention, which basically uses a hardware-enforced mechanism to disallow write to memory pages that contain code. So if a memory page contains code, this defense mechanism protects it from modification. So an attacker, even with knowing the address uh, of the code, cannot change the actual code. And if you look at the, the model for memory corruption, we see that this policy fits right into the code integrity area. And it enforces strong guarantees for code integrity so that if this protection is used, as it is for any non-just-in-time compiled code, we can guarantee that the attacker cannot modify any of the code at runtime. This does not hold, data execution prevention is not used for just-in-time compiled code, and that's where the attackers uh, abuse it. And it prevents all code corruption attack if it is in place. A uh, second defense mechanism uses stack canaries and uh, safe exception handling. And the idea is to partially protect some code pointers, namely return addresses on the stack from attacker-based modification. Um, it is one of the probabilistic defenses. So um, it changes the, uh, it checks the return instruction pointer before it is actually used. And uh, the dashed line shows partial protection so it only protects the return instruction pointers, and the gradient shows a probabilistic protection that can be circumvented if the attacker learns the secret through a set of attacks. So all the a drawback of the probabilistic defenses is that they can be circumvented by an information leak. So if the uh, attacker learns the randomization secret, the attacker can circumvent these defense mechanisms. And it dep uh, protects the user as well on the same way. Um, and protects somewhat against some control flow hijack attacks. So the last technique that I'm going to present here is address-based layout randomization. And ASLR is, was until recently one of the most effective techniques that we had. Um, and it randomizes the layout of code and data targets. So it's a pro another probabilistic technique and it randomizes the locations of both code and data. But it's probabilistic and partial. So it does protect, it, the, uh, protect against these, uh, these attacks somewhat, but not completely. So if you look at all the widely deployed defenses, we see that we have full protection against code corruption, but only partial protection against control flow hijack attacks, which still allow the attacker full computational resources on a machine and very little protection against data only attacks. So we can basically conclude that the, the deployed defenses that we have on current systems are incomplete and not effective against the current attacks. And we have to see how we can do better than that. So to summarize the model, uh, the model that we presented here allows to reason and classify different attacks and defense mechanisms along this model and allows us to compare these individual defense mechanisms according to this, to this list. And we can also classify the security policies on top of it and reason about the, the power of attacks. Um, it allows us to identify properties that enable wide adoption of defense mechanisms. So we evaluated over 60 or 80 now different defense mechanisms and policies, uh, but only four of them were enabled in practice. And all of them uh, had these properties, had these common properties. First of all, low overhead is key for adoption. If your defense mechanism has more than 10% overhead, nobody's going to use it. Uh, a second important property is 
you need to have compatibility with legacy code and with source code. If you don't support legacy binaries that cannot be modified, you're out of luck and your defense mechanism will not be used. If you don't support libraries, your defense mechanism will not be used. Also, you need to, get, you need to protect against classes of attacks. You need to provide a, a good reason to, uh, to actually use it in practice. Um, are there any quick questions for this part of the talk? Yeah. So the, the defense that we, uh, the different kind of mechanism that we've talked about, that still doesn't work for the terminal C, right? So the question was if the attack, uh, if the defense mechanism that we currently have protects against return to libc attacks as well. You are absolutely right. The, all the defense mechanisms, that's return to libc attack is one of the current attack vectors that are used to circumvent all of these uh, defense mechanisms. More generally, return-oriented return programming, where an attacker kind of stitches different existing code sequences together and uses them to run arbitrary computation is exactly what's used nowadays. Either return-oriented programming or jump-oriented programming. Yeah. Uh, and we'll have to find policies that defend against these two attack techniques. So uh, there is no other technique other than, you know, um, modifying the address, uh, address armoring, I think. Um, that's, that's the only technique that they use right now for you know, the is there anything else in practice? Yeah. Uh, not no. much. Okay. <laughs> so let me present two security techniques uh, that uh, we developed. So the first is a secure execution platform, which protects against different form of control, different forms of control flow hijack attacks, and it follows the design properties that we defined before. Um, it supports legacy binaries, and the idea is to detain and contain, uh, detect and contain vulnerabilities in the presence of buggy software um, and protect the integrity of the system at all times. Um, most of the stuff that I present here was part of my PhD work back at ETH. So the underlying goal of the secure execution platform is that we have to support legacy binary code. So we don't get any fancy high level information, type information or data flow information. And we'll have to recover a lot of that information at runtime. The dynamic binary translation mechanism that we use allows us to virtualize the application. And it basically uses the application, uh, application's code as some form of uh, like bytecode and runs it on top of a virtual machine and adds additional defense mechanisms uh, on top of it. This bytecode or virtual machine-like approach allows us to split the application, uh, the execution of the application into two domains. The trusted domain that contains the virtual machine and the untrusted domain that contains the uh, running application. Uh, also, we leverage a lot of runtime information which enables us uh, to have more precise security checks compared to, to other approaches. And generally, so to give you a bit of uh, like the High-level overview is, instead of running an application directly with, with full access to the kernel, we wrap the application into a box in user space and enforce our small virtualization system around the application. We execute the application completely in a sandbox and control all interactions and the execution of every single machine code instruction inside the application according to a specific policy. We add a trusted loader that uh, allows us to gain more information about the running program and enforce these properties while it is executed. And in addition to that, we add a system call policy that enforces the interaction or the limits the interaction of the application with the operating system kernel. If you imagine, if you run any application on your system, it has full access to all the uh, kernel functionalities or all the functionalities a kernel provides. But any application only needs a restricted subset of these functionalities. And it makes sense to restrict these functionalities to what only the application uses in its current form. If every application has full access to all the functionalities, it's uh, too permissive and might lead attackers to abuse these privileges. So to give you a glimpse into the sandbox implementation, uh, I will quickly discuss what we do with the original code and how we implement the, the just-in-time compiler. So we do have original code that is 
loaded into the address space of the application. But instead of executing it, we use a dynamic translator that reads individual machine code's ins instruction and translates it into protected code that is in the same address space but hidden from the attacker. And during the execution, we add a shadow stack which protects the return instruction pointers on the stack from ongoing attacks. So the attacker cannot modify it because the shadow stack is in the trusted domain. And we can ensure protection against any form of return-oriented programming. In addition to that, we introduce a set of control flow checks on top of it, which protect against different forms of jump-oriented programming and enforce some light form of control flow uh, integrity. Also, at this level, we enforce the system call policy and ensure that only the val uh, we can only call the well-defined system calls according to the well-defined properties that we have. Uh, and all in all, this protects from most control flow hijack attacks. And to give you some ballpark numbers about the overhead, uh, the average overhead for just the binary translator runs around 6%, and it's 15 point something percent for the full defense mechanism that adds all these additional guards on top of it, which is fairly reasonable, but higher than the 10% that I proposed in the beginning. So if you go back to the model and look at the defense mechanism that we have uh, deployed in practice, the secure execution platform adds an integrity property and protects the uh, most code pointers from modifications. So it gives strong deterministic guarantees for code pointers on the stack, and it gives strong guarantees, but uh, almost as strong guarantees for code pointers on the heap. Uh, due to the limited information in the binaries, we cannot give uh, full control flow integrity, but a subset of it. This is why the line is still dashed. And due to running in a binary translator, we can also detect the usage. So whenever one of these code pointers is used, we can enforce additional checks. And we get very strong protection against control flow hijack attacks. And also, uh, unfortunately, nothing against data-only attacks. And this is um, an area for, for future research. So to summarize the secure execution platform, uh, the platform supports both legacy uh, supports legacy binary code and allows the protection of existing applications, existing libraries, without any additional information that we have. Um, we have strong control flow hijack protection using a shadow stack and a dynamic form of CFI that uses the locality that is available in these binaries. And we have a system call policy as a secondary form of protection against on a, 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 using a very coarse level uh, also, it protects somewhat against data-only attacks, but uh, this is arguable. Uh, also, it enables a set of additional transparent security policies that you can implement on top of the binary translator. Imagine having a virtual machine that is able to extract information at runtime and use that information to enforce stronger and additional security policies on top of it. Some of the drawbacks of this approach are that it has, while it has low overhead it is not negligible. So there's still some overhead around that we have to worry about. And we'll see in, this, in the third part of the talk how we approach this. Also, uh, as I said before, the precision for the uh, protection on the heap is limited due to the partial information that we can recover from the binaries. So it is very hard to recover high-level control flow graphs from just the binaries and detect all the possible interactions, especially if we continue to support uh, libraries as well. So um, are there any burning questions for this part? OK. Otherwise, I'll move over to the next part and tell you how we address some of these problems. Um, I'm going to introduce code pointer integrity. And this is a strong policy based on recompilation of code. So the secure execution platform went a long way. But there's only so much that you can do with binaries. And we want to look into stronger protection with lower overhead, ideally. So we want to have both, both, both sides of it. Uh, therefore, we use the information which is available at compile time 
to enforce stronger security policies and remove unneeded checks using some form of compiler analysis. Uh, which is, uh, this project is a, lo a logical continuation of the secure execution platform for applications where we have source code available. And it's a joint project uh, during my time at Berkeley with people at EPFL Lausanne and uh, Stony Brook. So to give you the, the overview, memory safety would stop control flow hijack attack, as we've seen in the model. So if we would enforce memory safety, we would get rid of all the security problems that we have. Unfortunately, memory safety has very high overhead. And um, for example, softbound and CTS, which is a tool that enforces uh, or implements memory safety on top of CRC++, reports roughly 250% overhead on average. And that's clearly not cutting it if we want to use it as a uh, defense mechanism on current, current software. So what we figured was that, well, we don't need memory safety for all the data that we have. We only need memory safety for the data we care about. So we started to look into enforcing memory safety for code pointers only. We split the memory that the application has into a control plane and a data plane, and we check all loads and stores of code pointers and enforce strong security guarantees for code pointers and all dependent types. So if a struct has a code pointer, the struct will be protected as well, and recursively. So the, the question now becomes, how can we enforce the integrity of the selected subset of data? Even when we, when we assume that an attacker has full access to all unprotected data. So therefore, we split memory of the application into, as I said, into two planes, the control plane and the data plane. And we use additional protection that we can enforce through the compiler to secure the control plane from any modifications. So if you look at the memory layout, um, we have, again, the view of the data on a heap and a code. And let's just build it up and discuss which part of the data would go into the uh, secure area and which one would remain in the attacker accessible uh, regular memory area. So we do have uh, two functions in our code function A and function B. And we add two additional, uh, we have two structs that point to these, these functions. These structs could be a C++ object with vtable pointers or just regular C objects that, or regular C structs that contain a function pointers. Um, both structs have uh, pointers to functions. And uh, to make it more interesting, we'll add another pointer for, from struct B to an integer and have another pointer which we call or which we'll define as a void pointer that points to either or of these two structs. Uh, but the void pointer may also point to the integer to make it more interesting. And we have an other pointer that points to our initial pointer uh, with, uh, with a specific type. Now the question becomes, uh, softbound would protect all of these pointers on the, on the heap in the data area. Now we need to come up with an analysis that kind of allows us to protect only a subset of these pointers. And fewer is better. So what we do is um, we initially start by marking all pointers as protected and then remove as many as possible to come up with a safe way of restricting the subset of uh, protected pointers. And what al our algorithm ends up selecting is the two pointers that directly point to code pointers. And in addition to that, any dependent type. For example, the void pointer in this case might point to either struct A or struct B, so it must be protected as well if it points to one of these. Uh, in general, we don't like to uh, instrument void pointers due to performance reasons in the end. And in addition, uh, we have to protect pointer one as well because if an attacker could subvert pointer one at one point in time, uh, the attacker could come up with a complete copy 
of these data structures and use those to drive along. Do you have a question? <laughs> so yeah, we protect all these four pointers, uh, but only these four pointers. All other pointers uh, are not code pointers or not uh, dependent on code pointers and can therefore be left unprotected. Um, we came up with a prototype implementation on top of it. Uh, we started with LLVM 3.3 and modified Clang to carry on or carry along additional type information into the bitcode. So as it turns out with the example that you've seen before, if you have such void pointers, it is very hard to decide if you need to instrument them or not. And we carried additional type information about before the data area was cast into void uh, along into the LLVM bitcode so that we can use it for further analysis and de then decide if we want to, de uh, to protect a specific location or not, depending on the original type without having to look just at the void data type. On one hand, for the heap, uh, we have implemented a safe pointer store, which is based on a, on a hash table and indexed by the regular addresses. And the, uh, this safe pointer store stores all the protected code pointers on the heap and the dependent pointers. And we store the location, the value of the pointer, and bound information. And the code itself is modified so that for each load and store, we check these, uh, the bound information and ensure that the pointer is still valid and correct. And we also assume that the attacker does not have access to this uh, code, uh, data area. This seems to be an interesting open office bug. Um, so the second point that we have is the, the line that you don't see around here is uh, that's what updates get you, <laughs> right? Um, is uh, a double stack, double stack approach, where we assume that um, we run a stack-based analysis on every function, and by default, everything. Uh, so instead of having one stack frame per function. We have uh, we split it into two stack frames: an unsafe stack frame that an attacker may have access to, and a safe stack frame where we can ensure that the attacker does not have access to. So instead of for uh, having one stack for each thread, we have two stacks: an unsafe stack and a safe stack. Um, everything starts off on the unsafe stack, and using uh, compiler analysis, we propagate the variables from the unsafe stack to the safe stack if we can prove that the variable never leaves the unsafe, uh, the, the local function, the scope of the function, if it is not, uh, if we can prove that the pointer arithmetic is safe and follows all the checks that we define, and um, if we can make sure that um, it, it is never passed into a callee or returned somewhere else. Uh, this allows us to improve the performance on the uh, on the stack protection. What we found out, one interesting note is that most functions for the for a huge ma majority, we don't actually need to allocate an unsafe stack frame at all because all the variables that we have are propagated into the safe stack frame, which is a, a nice way to reduce performance cost and it's much more performance than ha performant than having a shadow stack. Um, if we do a quick evaluation of our approach. Uh, we run it on SPAC CPU and for full CP, uh, code pointer integrity for C application we get around 3% overhead and if you look at the C and C++ benchmarks we get around 8.4 overhead which is well in the uh, allowed overhead for, uh, for these defense mechanisms. Also we have defined a relaxed policy which is still stronger than any control flow integrity policy can be, but relaxes some constraints of dependent types and reduces the protection of those dependent types. And for this po relaxed policy, uh, more details are obviously available in the paper. Uh, for this relaxed policy, we have 1.2% 1, 1 for C applications and only 1.9% overhead for C and C++ applications. Um, we protect from all attacks in the right benchmark 
which is uh, an exploit-based benchmark that tries to evaluate different uh, security properties of CFI-like implementations. And also we protect FreeBSD world. So we've recompiled a FreeBSD distribution with our compiler to show the maturity of the compiler, that it actually handles large amount of code and millions and millions of lines of code. Uh, so we run OpenSSH, Apache, Postgres, uh, PHP, you name it. It all runs on, on top of it. If you look at the memory model again uh, and look what, the, what kind of additional guarantees we get from the code pointer integrity, we see that it basically changes the code pointer integrity property in this memory model and replaces it with a solid box that uh, completely mitigates any control flow hijack attacks. In addition to that, whenever such a pointer is used, we can actually detect that an attacker modified it and report an error to the, to the programmer to actually fix the bug which comes back to the motivation that I presented to you in the beginning. So using this approach, we are able to detect that an ongoing attack is happening and we can inform the actual programmer of the application of an unintended modification of a code pointer and report it to fix the bug and uh, update the software. And all in all, this mitigates control flow hijack attacks and presents uh, a strong protection against uh, these forms of attacks. To summarize, uh, code pointer integrity mitigates all control flow hijack attacks and enforces memory safety and integrity of code pointers. In a second step, it detects and uh, attacks at runtime and allows us to inform the programmer about it. And again, like the uh, secure execution platform, it follows defense properties and is compatible with unprotected legacy code as long as the legacy code doesn't modify the code pointers. It supports shared libraries compared to control flow integrity, which doesn't. It has low performance overhead, or control flow integrity doesn't by default. There are some approaches that try to extend it um, fairly well. So at this year's PLDI, there's been an interesting extension about it. Um, so it has low performance overhead, and it protects against a complete class of attacks and mitigates control flow hijack attacks. Let me conclude. So low-level languages are here to stay. We need protection or strong protection against different forms of memory vulnerabilities. We need to enforce performance. We need to provide strong protection. And we need to provide compatibility with legacy code, legacy systems, or code that cannot be compiled otherwise anymore. Uh, I presented two approaches that mitigate control flow hijack attacks. On one hand, a secure execution platform for legacy code that interacts uh, or can interact with the code pointer integrity policy on the second, uh, in the second step that protects any source code. So if you have source code available, you would recompile the application using the, the code pointer integrity policy. If you don't have it available, you would run the remaining code under the secure execution platform, trying to provide the strongest protection possible. Future directions that are left open, if you remember the model for uh, memory attacks, are strong policies for data. So we have to protect data from uh, being modified by an attacker so that it, we can constrain the attacker even further. Also, in, uh, under the constraints of the performance guarantees and protection guarantees that we have to, to ensure. And with that, I would like to end my talk and open for any remaining questions. Questions? Uh, yeah. So, just to regard the if you could uh, please use your microphone so the question can be heard on our part. Okay. So, yeah, a question regarding. Going to push this. Yeah, question regarding the evaluation of the system. You mentioned that 2.9 or 3% overhead for the C uh, benchmark, and then 8.9 around that uh, for the C slash C++ benchmark. Mm -hmm. Is that cost because of uh, increased number of dependencies, uh, more objects to use, or for something else? That's a very good question. Um, so the, the question basically was, why do we have more overhead for C++ programs compared to C programs? 
And um, the biggest reason is that, so the, the overhead for both approaches comes from additional checks that we have to carry out for each code pointer that is accessed. For C programs, you rarely have code pointers at all. Uh, C++ programs, on the other hand, uh, you have a lot, of, uh, a lot of code pointers. So for example, virtual functions are implemented as code pointers. So as soon as you have a C++ program, there's just a huge amount of uh, code pointers on the heat heap that we have to protect. Even if these virtual functions are not used, whenever you allocate an object that might have a virtual pointer in it, a virtual function pointer in it, we have to protect it using these uh, specific writes and update the metadata structure as well. So it comes from the increased amount of uh, code pointers that are on the, on the heap that we have to protect. Yeah. Other questions? Um, for the recording, if you guys have questions, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer them. Thanks for coming to the talk. Thanks. <laughs>